Yes, and we're live, so over to you, Bryce. So welcome everybody uh, to Pangea Connect Startup for Applications Launch. Um, I know everybody is wondering why you're here. As we are starting right now, we have a number of people who are streaming in and um, we'll give just one minute for everybody to stream in that we can uh, start the session. So far we have about 90 people who have joined in um, and we have a few others that are coming in. So let's uh, give them one more minute and then we can begin. Okay, so welcome again. Uh, my name is Bright Gamelli Maudo, or rather Dr. Bright Gamelli Maudo, which I never use that much. I'll be a moderator today and be hosting this session. Uh, we have a wealth of information that we're gonna give from amazing panelists that we have here. And um, we are just gonna get a lot of information. So many questions, I did a poll the other day on Instagram and other social media platforms trying to find out from people what exactly, what are the struggles they go to as startups and how do they get to get funding and the like. A lot of people seem to have the same problem. They don't know where to start from. They don't know where to actually go to. They don't even know what, what is equity. They don't even know what is their first viable product. They don't know what is involved when trying to get funding and they don't even know where to turn to. Today, we want to be able to answer all of those questions um, of which we get to um, get to answer today. So there's a reason why we're here and we're here because of Pangea Trust Connect and um, the Pangea Trust through the support of Swedish International Agency has launched this to be able to help uh, micro, small, medium enterprises, startups in Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia to be able to get to you know, have access to funding from, um, from diaspora. And there's a lot of the questions that we're going to answer from this um, webinar. Uh, I'm not going to go so much into it because there are some, there's somebody else who's going to give you much more detail. Um, so there's a reason why everybody is here to get all that information. And as you can see, this is a free, free information. Information being free is actually really a, a great way to be able to get your hands on things that you don't get every day. As you can see, we have the panelists here. We have uh, Anlawi, who's the managing director of Pangea Trust, who I'm going to bring in in a, in a few minutes to give you more detail as to exactly why we're here. We have Felix Osoku, who is the senior program manager at CIDA. We have uh, Terry Adem Ademvesa, who's the chief business officer at um, NSC. We have a board of director of KNCCI, who's Julius Opio. We also have Paul Kimani, a founder CEO of WorkPay, uh, WorkPay Africa, which I believe major, majority of you have heard of before. We have Gatu Chege, who's a portfolio associate um, at Acumen East Africa. And then we have also Esther, we have Esther, Esther Ndeti, who's investment lead at Unicap. We have Awil Osman, um, whom I've, I've, I've met no long ago, and we've been having a chit chat or a very interesting person, uh, who's a Silicon Horn founder, uh, Iris Hub, um, Hub founder and CEO, and Dr. Tusif, who's the founder, Halal Agents and Startup Village. Um, so we're gonna hear from all of these people. We have, we're going to have a panel session. We're going to have uh, details as to um, how the program is going to flow. So for now, just some housekeeping rules. There's a chat box um, in the chat. You can ask questions as, as we go on. Please drop all your comments, drop your questions and make sure that you know that you can, um, 
feel free to ask questions as we go on so that as the program goes on, we can be able to address some of those questions and issues that you have. Um, but at the beginning, I'm going to hand over to Anne Lowy, who is the manager and direct, managing director for Pangea Trust to give us more detail about what is what's Pangea Trust and what is the program all about um, that we can get to have more insight on. So back to, over to you, Anne. Hello, thank you, thank you, Bright, and thank you so much. Uh, we are so delighted and honored to host everyone today. Um, today is a great day for us that we are here uh, to launch and tell you more about Pangea Connect call for application. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Lawi, uh, Managing Director of Pangea Trust. Uh, like I said, we are delighted and honored to host all of you today. Special appreciation to our partners here and other partners for support uh, for making this initiative possible. Also, I would want to appreciate all our participants and guests who created time to be with us here today. It's such a big day for us, so thank you so much. We will be able to announce and share more about Pangea Connect, a call for application, which is a huge milestone toward, towards increasing access to investment and opportunity for startup and high growth businesses in Africa. Uh, Pangea Trust Connect Africa startup, um, uh, African startup with competence, capital, and network to empower them for people, planet, and profit. For the last four years as Pangea, we have worked with more than 150 startups, um, uh, 150 startups, uh, which are African founded. Also, 46% of those have been women founded. And among those we have invested in, uh, uh, some of those have been able to 15x their investment in two years. Now, uh, just to uh, paint a bit of a picture and why we are doing what we are doing as Pangea. Uh, report done by Patek in 2019-2020 showed up to 94% of startups that raised uh, capital were expert funded. Well, only 6% of those that raised capital above 1 million USD uh, were African funded. Uh, that means that there are businesses which are high, we have high potential. You can go back to yes, uh, which have high potential for growth, but they don't have opportunity to be able to raise money. And that's why as Pangea, we are committed to change this investment landscape in Africa. For the last four years, as Pangea, we have been able to mobilize and channel investment um, uh, diaspora to mobilize and channel diaspora investment across Africa for African-funded businesses. Uh, next slide. We see a huge opportunity working. Uh, see, we see huge opportunity unlocking diaspora investment as form of investment. Cons considering other uh, investment forms have been previously affected by epidemic. Remittances inflow into African continent have surpassed foreign direct investment and foreign aid as the largest source of income capital. In particular in Kenya, we have around 4 million people living abroad constituting the diaspora community. Um, in 2020, uh, for example, uh, Kenya remittances inflow stood at USD 3.1 billion report by World Bank. This is defined the economic downturn due to the to pandemic. At the same time, uh, World Bank predicts an increase of remittances to the continent as well as to the country by 6 to 8% in 2021. However, uh, despite the high remittances inflow into the country of 3.1 billion, only less than 5% of these remittances went to investment, uh, to businesses as investment. And that's where we see a huge opportunity as, a, as, a, as an organization to be able to catalyze diaspora demographic to channel more funds as investment to start up in high growth, um, and high growth businesses in Africa, starting with Kenya, Somalia, and Ethiopia as our starting point. And we see this possible to increase the shares of remittances set aside as investment to 25 to 30% by 2030. This will translate roughly to 900 million USD if we were to use 3.1 as our base figure uh, for the capital and investment that will be available for startup and high growth companies in Africa. 
Now, to make this possible, uh, Pangea Trust has been uh, working and have been supported by CEDA uh, and has been implementing Diaspora Innovative Partnership Initiative that strive to bring together Africa diaspora investors, startup and high growth businesses uh, in Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia as a pilot. We intend to scale this up across Africa by creating an innovative digital platform targeting to unlock diaspora remittances as, in, um, as investments to high growth businesses in Africa starting with Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. Now, the key activities for this initiative include diaspora remittance mapping study in Kenya, Somalia, and Ethiopia. This is a, an activity targeted to understand um, motivation and investment appetites for diaspora communities and their friends, uh, friends of diaspora who are willing to channel remittances as investment towards businesses in Africa, starting with Kenya, Somalia, and Ethiopia. Another key activity activity is diaspora fundraising uh, that we are geared toward creating an innovative platform to channel investment from these constituents that is diaspora communities and their friends and also um, carry out a fundraising mechanism and mobilization of remittances and investment that will be channeled to the businesses that we are tar targeting across Africa. Another key activity is institutional partnership where we want to drive value adding partnership across the region to be able to see how we can scale and collaborate with other like-minded partners. Another key activity is Islamic financing, try to explore how can we unlock and activate uh, Sharia compliance uh, investment to be channeled to uh, Sharia compliant business across uh, Africa, starting with Ethiopia, Somalia, um, and Kenya as for the pilot. The next slide. Um, we have been able to some, uh, be able to uh, conclude on one of the activities, which is the Astra Mapping Study, which will be launching soon. I will be having uh, the launch to be able to share the findings and the recommendation. But some of the uh, uh, some of the findings and recommendations that we have been able to observe are very interesting, and we would want to share with you today. Uh, one of them being 59 percent of diaspora remitters surveyed. Uh, expressed interest uh, to explore digital investment uh, opportunities. Another key insight is few digitally available options exist to be able to facilitate remittances as investment in startup or business, especially in East Africa. Also interestingly, uh, that a finding that came out is that there is lack of sufficient credible information, uh, and it's a biggest obstacle holding back decision-making uh, to invest in startups uh, across Africa. Another key uh, insight that came out of this study is trust, and trust is a big one, and it comes in different layers. Uh, for example, do I trust myself to make the right choice? Uh, do I trust the platform that exists? Do I trust the channels, which is paramount to guarantee repeat investment and referrals? Now, um, we are here today to unveil the call for application uh, that we seek uh, to identify high growth businesses across uh, Kenya, Somalia, and Ethiopia to start with. Uh, and apart from the normal investor readiness and technical support for these businesses, the offering for these will also include uh, access to diaspora network and technical expertise on new market and scaling opportunities. Also, the businesses will have access to exciting opportunity to unlock investment powered by diaspora remittances, not only from diaspora communities only, but also friends of diaspora uh, globally. Uh, another uh, benefit that the businesses that will be selected will have access to a fresh perspective from African diaspora communities, uh, community of investors uh, with extensive knowledge and passion supporting Africa founded businesses, as well as smart investment between $20,000 to $150,000. Uh, also, uh, the businesses will have access to diaspora network of mentors, expertise, as well as new market entry and voting. Now, um, our selection process, and we see this as a very competitive um, 
process from our end. We expect more than, more than 500 applications coming through. Um, and we will go through the screening and selection process of the most potential businesses to start with uh, in the three countries, from three countries. Uh, the selection criteria will, among other things, will include uh, domain expertise and competence team. Uh, the solutions of the businesses applying must at least have technology um, focused angle, uh, scaling and marketing opportunities that the business at least must have a market uh, that they have identified, strong impact angle, and they must be post revenue. Uh, um, as well as uh, as part of the as, as part of the process, the, the, the process will include selection committee and due diligence uh, team with expertise in finance, legal, business mind, among other expertise. We'll also have interviews as a part of the process for the finalist businesses. We intend to select 10 businesses that will progress to investments consideration. Now, in terms of our timelines, we have a call for application open uh, right now that will close uh, by 24th of September. Uh, we also have screening and selection happening uh, at the closure, uh, which is on 24th of October. And we run through to October uh, 10th. We will announce the 10 finalists uh, that will uh, that will enable us to kick off the due diligence um, process, as well as, as uh, kick off the investor readiness that will be informed by need, ass need assessments that we will do to be able to understand the KYC of the businesses that will be selected for investment consideration. We expect to start having the initial decision making for investment by December. Now, thank you so much. Uh, it has been a pleasure being able to give you a highlight of what we are doing and the initiatives that we are carrying out um, regarding the Diaspora Innovative Partnership Project that we have been supported by SIDA. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anlawi. Um, that was really insightful. And we, there's, so, there's so much that I, that I've picked from there. Um, two main things that I think I, I took note of, and I think it runs across. Uh, but before that, even, um, I want to welcome some people who are here. Uh, we see Anthony Murigi, uh, founder of Ukulima TV and Ukulima Magazine. Uh, Vincent Kisai, founder and CEO of Data Network Institute. Agnes Makoka, Benson Awili, Mumbi King. Welcome everybody who is joining in and who is streaming wherever you are from. I know we are from many countries right now who are part of this uh, uh, Pandya Connect. Um, I, I picked a few things, which is to do with trust, getting credible information, be able to understand exactly what is this, what are people even doing as startups for you to be able to invest. And that's a, a lot of questions people ask from um, who want to invest from diaspora have no idea where to look from. Um, so we're gonna have the conversation going and we get the panelists, we're going to have, make sure that we address some of these questions and be able to uh, get answers to the details that, um, that, you, just, that you have just given us. Um, please, um, everybody who's joining right now, we are on all social media platforms. Um, the hashtag today, the hashtags, not hashtag, hashtags today is to do with, uh, is, is Pangia Connect, Pangia Trust, Pangia Startups, um, please tweet, tweet, share, tag them on Instagram, take your phone out right now. I want everyone to take a phone out for the next 10 seconds. Just take a picture of what you're seeing on the screen. Uh, that's just me, but no, when the next speaker comes in, <laughs> take a picture of the next speaker, uh, be able to tweet about him, what you're seeing right now. Uh, we're trying to talk about 500 plus applications that, that are going to come in. We're looking at the domain expertise, competence team, technology focus, scaling and marketing opportunities, strong impact angle, and post revenue. All of those might be juggles to you, but we want to try and break them down, diversify them into various ways. So get on Twitter, it's at Pangea Trust. Get on Instagram, at Pangea Trust. Look at LinkedIn, look for Pangea Trust. Go to Facebook, it's what? Pangea Trust. So that's easy. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is a very important person to this uh, initiative, um, and Sida, who is Sida, uh, uh, who is our, who is part of this, um, who's a, a main sponsor and partnership of this. Sida is a Swedish International Development Corporation Agency and the senior program manager, who is called Felis Osok. 
is about to speak next. I'm not going to give too much information about him, but I'd like him to introduce himself um, to this program and give us some welcome remarks from the embassy, uh, from the Swedish embassy. So welcome, Felix. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bright, and thank you, everybody, for uh, I mean, participating in this very, very important uh, yeah. webinar. Uh, Felix, your, your sound is it low? Is it, is it me? No, it's, it's clear. Go ahead, please. It's clear? Yes, it is. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so thank you again. And um, yeah, just as a disclaimer, I, I'm not really feeling well today. I had my vaccine yesterday and the side effects are terrible, but I say that I have to uh, participate in this. So sorry, I, not I, I hope you, you, you'll get back soon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Just so take, I'm going to speak paracetamol. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to speak about five uh, issues. Um, uh, I've been asked to speak about the opportunities and uh, broader stakeholder engagements in uh, uh, leveraging uh, uh, capital resources uh, from the diaspora, but as well as uh, from other uh, sources. And uh, I'll start by introducing uh, CEDA's uh, strategy or development cooperation uh, work with uh, Kenya. Then uh, uh, I'll also talk about the several uh, other four um, perspectives of uh, poverty that CEDA focuses on in, uh, in our work. Number three, I'll also talk about uh, why CEDA is interested in this sector, that is the micro uh, small enterprises. Uh, fourth one, I'll talk about the instruments that CEDA uh, have at its uh, disposal with regard to capital mobilization. And uh, finally, I'll touch on uh, the broader relations and uh, which strategy do we have beyond, uh, beyond uh, aid. Uh, so to start with, um, as you all know, CEDA's uh, uh, International Development Cooperation is uh, basically to create conditions to improve the lives of poor people living in poverty and oppression. And uh, uh, this work is based on four principles. The first one is um, uh, aid and development effectiveness, uh, the issue of aligning our work with other development partners, uh, harmonizing uh, in order to uh, enhance uh, the delivery of uh, uh, development activities. We have the 2030 agenda, which uh, is also called the Sustainable Development Goals, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, and finally Paris Agreement. So our uh, development cooperation with Kenya, uh, running from 2021 to 2025, is based on these four principles. Uh, briefly, the first pillar, that is uh, the activities uh, under the three key objectives. The first one is um, work involving human rights, democracy, the rule of law, and gender equality. For example, what do we do with regard to, I mean, strengthening uh, institutions that deliver uh, respect for human rights or uh, institutions like uh, IBC, for example, that we work close uh, with? How do we ensure that there is access to and respect for sexual and reprodu reproductive health and rights? Uh, so that falls under the human rights, democracy, the rule of law, and gender equality. And of course, business and human rights go hand in hand. The second pillar is uh, the environment, climate, and sustainable use of natural uh, resources uh, for reduced climate impact, and of course, resilience to climate change. The third pillar where uh, I majorly work with, but of course, across the other pillars, is uh, inclusive economic uh, development, which looks at... Uh, uh, which looks at sustainable or improved conditions for productive employment and uh, decent work, as well as free and fair trade. This pillar focuses as well on uh, strengthened systems for better access to social security. Uh, one important uh, key that I'd like to um, elaborate on is, uh, I mean, CEDA's uh, perspectives on, uh, um, on uh, poverty. Uh, CIDA acknowledges that poverty manifests itself in different dimensions, and each of these four dimensions have intrinsic value and, of course, instrumental value. Uh, the first dimension, I mean, therefore, we have opportunities and choice. We have human security, poverty and voice, and uh, resources. And I know you're wondering, yes, uh, what, what are you referring to 
uh, when you talk about these uh, uh, dimensions. The first one um, that touches on uh, opportunities and, uh, and choice, uh, we all know that uh, people have different opportunities um, and there are a lot of bottlenecks that limit the access to such opportunities like social security, access to capital, uh, access to land, for example, uh, touching on, for example, uh, um, uh, societal uh, bottlenecks that uh, impede women from uh, accessing uh, land opportunities or asset ownership, inheritance matters, uh, perceptions of childbirth and uh, name it. Uh, we have human security. Of course, we all know that there are conflicts uh, related to natural resources, land, water, food. How do we, do we address uh, these forms in our work that is looking at the multidimensional poverty analysis? Power and voice, of course, we all know. Uh, in order to influence the society, influence the government to deliver on its services, uh, you need to know how do you uh, reach out. Uh, and it involves you know, capacity building such that we are able to leverage uh, in a more informed position with regard to uh, rights. The last one is uh, resources. And of course, in order to reduce poverty or fight uh, poverty, you need access to resources. That is just in a, in a nutshell. Uh, why is CEDA interested in the micro, small, medium enterprises uh, sector? Uh, we all know that uh, uh, many, or uh, I would say over 80% of uh, employment lies in the informal sector, uh, that is in form of micro, small, medium enterprises. Um, but at the same time, this is a sector that is uh, a bit forgotten, facing several challenges. Some of them you've uh, already mentioned in your, in your presentation, that is access to capital. There's always a uh, uh, issues to do with, uh, uh, I mean, record keeping. Uh, how do you present your business uh, idea? I've met a lot of uh, micro small enterprises that are holding on to, you know, a briefcase company uh, instead of inviting uh, investors who could uh, act or hold their hands, uh, mentor them, and also reach a fairly good deal on uh, equity. And, uh, and that, but you need to be informed on how to go about this. And you find that many of these micro small enterprises always die. I mean, the maximum that they're giving is five years. There's a reason why. So how can we influence uh, these? Uh, there are several uh, instruments that CEDA uh, puts into place uh, in order to, for example, um, mobilize uh, resources uh, capital together with the private sector. We realize that, uh, I mean, uh, official development aid is not enough to meet all the sustainable development goals by 2030. Uh, and in order to mobilize enough resources to, uh, to meet these uh, obligations, we have to work with the private sector. Uh, one of the key instruments is public-private uh, development partnership, where CEDA works with the private sector, government institutions to leverage on their knowledge, technical know-how, skills um, as a, a catalytic way of uh, multiplying investments. Uh, the other one would um, uh, be guarantees. And uh, um, a lot of impact investors would really want to invest in uh, these uh, micro and small medium enterprises. Uh, but the challenge is always uh, security. You find that when you get to many of these companies, governance at the board level is, I say, pathetic. Uh, many of them are, you know, individual companies or family-owned, but uh, there is insufficient transparency um, and uh, accountability. So an investor would uh, ordinarily fear getting in uh, as much as. Uh, the idea of the business model would be excellent. So how does CEDA come in with guarantee funds to impact investors? Right now, there's a call for uh, uh, impact investors within renewable energy, uh, for example, where uh, CEDA will provide a, a guarantee in the event, I mean, you lose your investments and so on. So it's shared uh, risk taking uh, with CEDA. We have challenge funds, for example, African Enterprise Challenge Fund. I think you, uh, you all know uh, the fund. Um, where um, 
micro, small, medium enterprises can, of course, uh, apply for call for proposals to compete where the best uh, startup or uh, business with a good business model and so on could be uh, supported. Uh, to support that, there are also other uh, challenge funds and accelerator programs. These are more of a fixed, uh, fixed term uh, training for startups, uh, mentorship until uh, they come to a level where they're able to, to, to scale up or uh, investor readiness as you uh, call it. And these are instruments that CEDA uses uh, in order to mobilize uh, uh, more resources from the private uh, sector and ensure that uh, the challenges that MSC, uh, micro small enterprises meet um, are addressed. Um, point uh, four, and, uh, uh, said I will talk about broader relations and it touches as well on the issues that I've uh, uh, mentioned. I mean, uh, aid is not, uh, um, um, how do I say, sustainable. At some time, see that we stop uh, international development cooperation with regard to grants. And what happens beyond uh, these? As I've mentioned as well, uh, in order to create long lasting sustainable relationships, it is very important to work with the private sector, research institutions, government, and um, and public institutions to leverage on uh, their know-how. There are things that CEDA or other development partners can really not do. When you look at the market systems, these are systems that are created by the government, by the public sector. How do you influence them? You cannot influence them alone as a development partner. You have to cooperate with uh, others. And we are looking at uh, cooperation broadly within informal sectors, business and human rights. How do we collaborate with the uh, that is the Central Organization of Trade Unions, COTU, on uh, implementing the Kenya National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. Kenya being the first country in the continent, Africa to actually come up with such a draft and, and, and adopt it. How do you uh, integrate social dialogue in workplaces for uh, decent work? Green jobs, at the end of the day, companies, enterprises how to, have to realize that actually driving their businesses sustainably uh, will lead to uh, more profit making and uh, sustainability of these businesses in the long run. Uh, but we have to work with the private uh, sector to do to do this. Uh, the other key thing, and that is why we are here, um, diaspora. There's a lot of huge uh, remittances from the diaspora. Just looking at the Nordic uh, alone, the, uh, the four countries, the huge remittances that go to Kenya, Ethiopia, Somali, um, that uh, unfortunately are invested in uh, maybe not really sustainable businesses, household incomes and so on. So how do we work with the diaspora such that we can tap into the 340 million USD that came into Kenya 2020 just from the diaspora? Uh, CBK or the Central Bank of Kenya realizes that remittances from diaspora is uh, one of the great um, additionalities to the GDP in the country and really ranked uh, high. So that is uh, uh, one of the things. And uh, like uh, Anne had said, they've uh, done uh, a mapping of diaspora remittances, uh, working on now establishing um, a remittance uh, platform and, and, and so on, which uh, uh, we hope to continue uh, supporting. Islamic finance is another way of mobilizing capital. This is one industry that actually people do not know so much about, but it mobilizes. I mean, it's a $3.5 trillion industry. You can just imagine. That's a lot of money. Uh, but we are used to con conventional financing from the conventional banks. How do we, again, work with these actors in order to tap into these uh, uh, capital base for micro, small, uh, medium enterprises uh, development. And these are some of the things that we are really keen on uh, working on together with many other partners besides uh, uh, Pangea. So if uh, there's something that interests you from whatever I've mentioned, uh, uh, reach out. We have a huge uh, value chain within agriculture. Uh, one of the flagship projects, uh, the embassy is driving in Kenya is, go, is called Agricultural Sector Development Support Program, where uh, three, I mean, counties have chosen three 
value chains that they would like to develop. For example, TC has chosen a banana value chain, uh, sorghum, sugarcane. Um, Kisumu, for example, has chosen fish, uh, cotton, and uh, and um, um, poultry or indigenous chicken. So all these three value chains is how do we commercialize the three value chains to look at these agricultural value chains as a business moving from now um, consumption or peace and farming to more commercial uh, farming. Uh, lastly, uh, I have to mention to our work within uh, uh, the financial uh, industry. Uh, somebody mentioned the key, I mean, a very important aspect, and that is trust. We've been working with financial sector, depending over the years, the last 10 years, on uh, developing four pillars. That is the financial regulatory framework for, I mean, businesses to operate. For example, FSD through the support of CEDA and other donors like uh, Gates and um, FCDO, former David, have financed FSD to come up with a digital economy policies. Uh, you all know about M-Pesa, but you really don't know maybe how uh, mobile uh, uh, finance actually became a policy because at that time, banks uh, were the sole institutions that uh, did mobile financing. And you remember there was a lot of fight, but then FSD together with the uh, National Treasury, CBK, came up with uh, uh, policies to regulate mobile financing also for telecom companies. Uh, that is with regard to M-Pesa. Uh, you know about PesaLink. Uh, we've been uh, quite instrumental in uh, supporting the creation of this uh, uh, regulatory framework. And that is working with trust in the society. The other thing is creating value. I mean, you won't really be using all these instruments if there is no value in using them. So how do you create value such that that particular kiosk owner can see value in using M-Pesa, for example, to do uh, financial transactions or these pay bills and uh, tail numbers you know, to, to conduct their business for purposes of record keeping and so on. Uh, we also support innovations, and this is a part of it, fintech. You know, Kenya is a big uh, ground for uh, fintech. Many international uh, companies or countries come and do uh, their pilots here. But uh, it is very important that this capital that is mobilized to Kenya also support local enterprises and revolves in the society and it's not plowed back to you know the foreign countries so how do you also work with uh, this uh, the last besides trust value it's uh, creating uh, i mean reducing transactional costs i mean many of you could remember when mpesa for example came uh, transactional costs were pretty high to transfer for example a thousand shillings today as we speak it has been reduced by three quarters and that is now creating value for the uh, uh, business people. So we do a lot with FSD as well as in the support of micro, small, medium enterprises and uh, also in reaching out to other private sector actors, small entrepreneurs and startups. Uh, I think I'll uh, end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, you've brought us great insights there. Um, Again, trust has come in as, a, as another thing that we've been looking at. Um, people take advantage of CEDA, share risk taken with CEDA. Uh, and something that we've um, you've mentioned, which is Islamic funding, which we know most people don't know about, it will be the second panel that will come in later, where I'll be talking to Dr. Tusif and uh, Will Osman uh, about Islamic funding. And we'll have some quite a very good information and um, session there. Um, so thank you very much, Felix. Um, we're going to move to the next speaker. Um, who is is Teddy Adem Adembesa, who's the Chief Business Officer at Nairobi Securities Exchange, um, very well uh, known in the finance uh, space, and he'll be speaking about um, on connecting the capital capital to opportunity in unlocking the desk for the position for better investment opportunities in SMEs. Uh, so welcome, Terry. Um, I know we're running a little bit uh, behind time, so if you could just please uh, try to keep it uh, short and sweet. <laughs> that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bright. Uh, and good seeing you today. Um, it's definitely a pleasure uh, joining all of you. And thank you for to the team at uh, Pangea Trust and uh, at CEDA 
uh, for putting this together. Uh, I hope I'm clear. You can you can hear me, uh, Doc. Loud and clear. Brilliant. Um, so I'm delighted to join you uh, today. Um, I'm seeing attendance is quite high, uh, which is a pretty uh, good thing. Um, and I, you know, this 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 launch um, launch webinar is 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 great, um, and it's critical. Um, I guess it's part of the um, initiatives um, that many institutions locally are working on uh, towards um, connecting um, SMEs uh, or, or, or the mid caps uh, with, with various um, avenues of capital. Um, in this case, you know, we're discussing about the diaspora remittances, the um, Islamic financing, but I also want to plug in one or two things one or two avenues um, from the exchange perspective, from the capital market space um, that we, you know, uh, interact with uh, here in Kenya. I think I think uh, this this call um, is equally timely, uh, given the role that uh, mid caps play in supporting the growth and uh, development of, of 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 our economies. Uh, in Kenya, we are told that. That mid cap um, contribute to about forty percent. Uh, contribute to about. 40, I promise you that's not my little one. Um, but we are told that mid caps in Kenya contribute to about forty percent of the country's GDP, employing in excess of fourteen million Kenyans, who of course are a major source of innovation, competitiveness, uh, goods and service, as well as entrepreneurial skills. Um, against that back backdrop um we know that you know the mid caps and startups play you know face uh financial challenges uh, which of course have been made worse with the pandemic uh, and this calls for you know urgent innovative solutions uh to 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 resolve of course the pandemic has stretched quite uh, financial capabilities of quite a number of uh, mid caps, and we are seeing quite, you know, a number uh, walking to us to the exchange uh, and asking us on how we could uh, help, uh, you know, help them during this period. Um, earlier in the year, the CBK, the central bank, uh, warned that about 75% of Kenya's uh, small and medium-sized businesses face collapse uh, if they fail to get fresh funding. Um, of course, this has been uh, as a result of the lack of credit buffers and other resources uh, to survive, uh, you know, the slowdown. This aforementioned uh, challenges, uh, you know, um, need, you know, they, they, they cause uh, a, a need for us to, 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 to raise uh, various aspects, various funding um, avenues. And I'm sure this, um, this, these problems, these challenges are also faced with uh, by, by uh, mid caps and startups, even in the region. Um, and in this case, as we are speaking, uh, you know, in markets like, like Ethiopia and Somalia. So again, I reiterate that this launch is timely uh, and is something that we would want to support. Um, over the last few years, the role of the diaspora community, um, you know, uh, has really grown. Uh, it's it's now something that we can't um, understate. Um, I think uh, one of the you know the top three um, FX earners for the country uh, is diaspora remit remittances. Um, we are told you know this has grown to in excess of two hundred billion Kenya shillings, about two billion three billion dollars uh, as at twenty twenty mid year. Uh, and 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 this has made Kenya uh, one of the highest uh, countries, you know, in Africa with remittances uh, at that level. So this is significant. It's not something that we can ignore. Um, of course, the challenge we know that you know the remittances are going to funding um, quite a bit of consumption, um, quite a bit of you know uh, support, uh, you know, from from the diaspora supporting. Uh, their families back home, but there is of course need for us to be able to tap into this pool of of cash, and see how you know uh, 
mid caps and uh, and startups can be supported. Uh, so where this is uh, is the leading market infrastructure uh, in the region, and we, you know, we we while we offer uh, a world class platform for the issuance of debt uh, and equity securities. Uh, there's still been a huge need to support uh, mid caps. So there are a number of initiatives that we've, 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 we've put in place. Uh, they might not be at startup phase, but uh, one, one, one of them has been the uh, Ibuka uh, program. Uh, the Ibuka program is really a, an incubator and acceleration program. We look at, you know, working uh, on accelerating the growth of, of enterprises. Uh, and I'm seeing there's quite a number of, of, of them here who have talked to us. Uh, and basically we try and you know, offer these companies uh, visibility, um, easier access to the capital markets players, uh, advisory services, um, and, and, and just support towards ensuring this you know, sustain, sustainability through uh, corporatization of, of, of some of these startups. Um, we know that a stable macro financial system is key towards supporting growth and job creation. Um, it enables savers to, to invest their financial assets in the financial system with confidence, uh, but it also provides investors the predictability and, and, and finance that they need uh, to invest in job creating uh, projects. In Kenya, the retirement benefit industry continues to evolve and grow at, uh, at quite a, a, a fundamental and a huge rate. Um, currently, we have about, um, and I had this figure this morning, close to 1.48 trillion. Um, this, you know, about 11, 11 $12 billion. Um, it's growing by about $3 billion annually. Um, and this, the bulk of this money is really um, invested in government paper or in uh, guaranteed investments such as uh, real estate, um, you know, and corporate paper. And, and there's a need to pull this cash uh, into, you know, um, the entrepreneurial space, uh, into startups, into, into the mid caps. So there's a bit of work that we need to work to do. Uh, of course, these investors, um, while, while they've pulled that cash, they, you know, they want to see strong corporate governance structures, they want to see sound financial positions, uh, current and future projections. So as a, as a startup or as a mid cap, you should be able to put that together. They want to see solid business cases, a, a, a good growth outlook and sustainability of the business. So I believe this forum is, is key towards uh, those discussions. Uh, and I, of course, wish you a fruitful deliberations. I look forward to uh, working with Pangea Trust and the entrepreneurs on this forum uh, to see how we can support you through the exchange and the capital markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, very good insights there. And uh, seems there's a lot of money that is flowing that we have no idea about. And people need to get access to that money from diaspora. Um, so just before we get into uh, the next speaker, who is going to give us a, a short speaking from a, a, a brief remarks from GSCI, I, I want everybody to just put on their camera. We take one nice selfie. I mean, put on the camera and do this. That's all we want. So if you could kindly just put on your camera, everyone. Yes. Taking the picture soon. Uh, okay. So, can we put our fingers up and say Pangia? Great. All right. So um, just keep on tweeting, keep on posting on social media platforms at Pangea Trust on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. The hashtag is Pangea Connect, Pangea Trust, Pangea Startups, or hashtag UPT. <laughs> Put all those hashtags if you have to, and make sure that you keep on sharing the conversation. And the, the chat box is still open. 
get to ask all the questions that you want to as the sessions are going on. Um, also, something that you need to know, uh, just a reminder that what you start to gain in this program, which I'll put in the chat, is smart investments between 20,000 to 150,000 US dollars, access to diaspora, network of mentors and experts, new markets entry to hold in further fundraising support and tools, opportunity to receive further investments, um, and access to deal flows investors, access to a, led, a leading network of experts and distribution network, which is quite hard most of the time, and the business receives mentorship from key industry experts and coaches to provide tell us support which is difficult to get as well so next i'm going to get a short keyword um which is how as how the micro um small and medium -sized enterprises can better position themselves for for the kinds of funding opportunities i'll be inviting the director of the KNS, KNCCI nairobi chapter and chairman um legends association limited julie sopio um somebody who will closely work with developers investors, finance, financials, and land owners to fulfill a wide range of real estate needs. Um, and clients include international and local institutions, individuals and diaspora invested in residential and commercial properties. I welcome Julius to take the stage now and be able to give us a short remarks, uh, very brief, um, as we like to keep it. So over to you, Julius. Um, since we're running, all, we're running behind time, I would like you to just keep it very, very short. and. Uh, uh, and, and straight to the point. Thank you. Uh, Judas, you're on mute. Okay, Julius has disappeared for a second. Yes. Oh, he's, okay. I'm on we now. can hear you. We can hear you. We can see you very loud and clear. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bright, and uh, thank you for having me in this session. I'll be brief and to the point because, due, because of lack of time. So in Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, we are an organization, a business membership um, organization that focuses on having uh, various businesses uh, joining our organization. And, we, and our members cut across all sectors of the economy uh, and, and consist of all sizes. So whether you're a micro enterprise or a big corporate, uh, we have uh, various categories for you, our members. And as a result of that, they're able to interact and look into various business opportunities and address any business challenges through the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Nairobi. But over and above that, we also have a global network as Kenya National Chamber of Commerce through uh, the World Chamber Federation, we have a network of over uh, 142 countries whereby we can easily access uh, these markets, uh, support, exchange ideas to the other world chambers, uh, organizations. Within the country, that is within Kenya, we have uh, 42 counties and in the, every county we have um, a chapter. So if you're in a remote location in Kenya, we have in a remote county, we have a presence there and businesses within those remote areas can actually access support. Um, now going to the, to the main activities within the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, one area we, we look at is business advocacy. Uh, we engage um, various institutions, both government and non-governmental organizations when it comes to advocacy. Uh, we've had advocacy in regards to taxation, uh, whereby sometimes uh, when the government comes up with taxation policies, we try and give feedback and guide them in regards to uh, what is the most appropriate way when it comes to tax. We also have um, uh, access to finance and investment. We give access to finance to our members to, through partnering with the various financial institutions. Like during the COVID epidemic, we had the MasterCard Foundation coming in and assisting our, our micro enterprises because they had been heavily impacted. We also give access in regards to investments. Uh, depending on the sector one is in, in, in our members are able to access um, investments. So we have both local and uh, foreign investment coming in into various sectors. Another area we also work with our partners is capacity building and training for our members. Uh, depending on the sector, we have various sectors have different needs and they're able to put up programs 
in regards to capacity building and uh, training. Another area that is of critical importance, especially as uh, enterprises or micro enterprises grow to small and medium enterprises is uh, corporate governance. Uh, this is an area that uh, we are looking into. We have partners that are giving us support in, our, in terms of how do we make uh, SMEs become and develop a corporate governance models within their structures. This is an area that I think um, I'd like to re-emphasize about, especially for companies that are looking for investments, uh, especially foreign investments, because corporate governance is an area that um, uh, we'll need to address. Maybe I'll talk about that more in the next point. Then another area is access to markets. We normally have in uh, inbound and outbound emissions, trade missions. Uh, we, we scaled down last year because of um, uh, the corona, corona pandemic. However, we're still able to access markets um, uh, virtually and through our networks, and we don't necessarily have to visit uh, physically. So access to markets in, like in Africa, an area of interest is um, the African continental trade uh, uh, agreement that was signed recently. We have Comesa, we have SADAC uh, uh, movements or areas. In the EU, we also have access to the EU and also access to uh, the Middle East. We have partnered with the various chambers of commerce in the different parts of the, of the world. For example, like with the Dubai Chamber of Commerce, our head office has actually set up even another office in the, in the UAE to assist businesses that are, part, that are doing business in the Middle East. And these are, these are some of the things we're trying to extend also within Africa and to the other continents around the world. Then when it comes to the, that's the sixth point is networking events and programs. We have various networking uh, activities. Uh, the last one we had was the SME financial inclusion uh, dialogue. And out of this dialogue, we are having this kind of discussion today. So we are very happy with Pangea Trust for having followed up on our last um, networking session in regards to financial inclusion. And we have more events and more programs coming up for our members. Now, what are the, I was asked to talk about um, the funding opportunities for MSME. So what I've done here is just to list down the, the main points in terms of uh, how do we go about um, accessing funding opportunities for the micro and small, especially for the micro and small enterprises. Uh, the first point that keeps on coming out is uh, investment readiness. We normally get so many requests from some of our members and non-members in regards to getting investment. And one challenge that we are faced with is that many of the requests that come through are not investment ready. So an area that we need to look at is how do we formalize our structures, come up with procedures, have professional operations within our small businesses as members of the chamber. And as a result of that, it gives us an easy, or an easier way to get uh, investments uh, coming in. I'd mentioned earlier on about corporate governance. In this, in this regard is how, how do you constitute a board for your organization uh, if, you're an, if you're a micro enterprise or if you're a small or medium enterprise? So corporate governance looks at it, how the board is constituted, what kind of uh, uh, policies and structures have you put in place within your organization to ensure that uh, the, there's minimal risk and uh, you abide with all the co corporate governance policies of uh, any business entity. The third point is SDGs. These are sustainable development goals. Mm, we have quite a number of uh, corporate entities which who are members of the chamber. For the big companies that want to work with micros, uh, enterprises and small enterprises, there's this direction that we're taking in regards to SDG goals. So you need to identify which are the priority SDG goals uh, as a micro enterprise. Uh, you'd be able to focus on uh, to, to, to grow your business. So, for example, if, if you went to point number four, environmental focus, um, if you have a green project or a, a, a blue economy project, it's easier for you as a micro enterprise to get funding if you're focusing on the, on, on the environment, like something like um, renewable energy, there's recycling. And that kind of thing. So an environmental focus gives you a lot of uh, funding opportunities as a micro enterprise. 
Another area is innovation, the use of ICT. Uh, currently, what we're seeing, there's a very big trend in Africa uh, that uh, big data is going to be big in Africa. And it's true, we've seen it happen um, with the M-Pesa. It started off in a, in, a telecom, in a telecommunication company. And now it is going beyond tele, just communication, but now into financial uh, services. Now, out of this, another opportunity that's coming out is through providing financial services, we're able to get now more data about the communities and the customers that we deal with. Now with big data, we're able to get into health, uh, education, uh, using ICT as a technology and using uh, various uh, devices when it comes to the internet of things to come up with the solutions that can bring down, for example, the cost of healthcare, the cost of providing education and also when running a business. So if you're in a micro enterprise space and you're in the ICT uh, space, or sector, uh, it's easier for one to get funding in, in this area. Another point is um, that when it comes to funding opportunities is partnerships. Uh, we would encourage our micro enterprises and medium enterprises, or even small, to go into partnerships wherever possible. Look for dealerships, uh, a franchise if you can get one, join professional and business membership organizations in your respective um, uh, countries or in uh, cities and use these partnerships to grow and uh, scale up your businesses. Another area that is of critical importance when it comes to uh, positioning and get and funding and looking for funding opportunities is uh, you should, we need to ask ourselves what kind of business are we in? We should be, a, we should be trying to solve a problem in our society and out of that solving that problem, then the business is able to uh, make money. So whatever we're trying to solve also should be transformational. And if it's transformational, then the business becomes sustainable and scalable going into the long term. And as somebody had mentioned earlier on that many businesses start but collapse and fail in, within before five years. And one main reason is because some of these businesses are not sustainable. So we need to be in a business or run businesses that are solving problems within our society. And as a result of that, we are able to sustain them. Now, another thing that's coming up is scale. Any investor who's going to come on board in uh, investing in any business will ask one question, can we scale up? And if the answer is yes, how big? So are we thinking uh, in terms of uh, the small town we're living in or the small, in, a, in one city, one country, one region, continent or the whole world. So I would also uh, encourage uh, enterprises to look at business, if possible, also from a global perspective. Look at the trends in your region, in your continent, and see how you can scale up beyond uh, the areas that you operate in, if it's in a city or in one, in one country. Now, the last point I'd like to talk about is uh, when it comes to investments is uh, if you come to Africa, or even in Kenya particularly, we normally invest in the traditional, uh, what I would say, vehicles. So one thing that Kenya, in Kenya you'll find is that many, many people when they invest want to buy land uh, and put their money in land or in real estate because they feel that's where the money is secure. However, there are very many more opportunities that are coming out and uh, we've we are seeing an opportunity in the stocks and securities markets, whereby if somebody is in the diaspora and you're sending money back home, remitting it back to Africa or to Kenya or to Nairobi for this matter, you want to use a vehicle that you trust, a vehicle that is, has minimal risk and a vehicle that you know in the next five years, your investment will be secure. So we're trying to bring uh, a different dimension when it comes to accessing funds and finance. And we'd like to encourage our, the micro enterprises to consider using the stocks and securities markets for advisory services. You can also have a vision whereby you grow your business to list it in the next five years. So you work closely uh, with the securities exchange. If you're in Nairobi, you will work with the Nairobi Securities Exchange. We have Johannesburg. In, uh, in South Africa, 
and if and if you are uh, how do you call it um, outside Africa, we also have London Stock Exchange, and in the US we have the New York Stock Exchange. But what I'm trying to say, these ex these exchanges have other services just beyond uh, trading in stocks and and um, and, uh, and securities. So based on that, I would like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. There's a lot more we can talk about, but due to lack of time, uh, I'll, I'll keep it short. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I know if I was to give you enough more time, you would have given us more, more, more conversation because those are very great points which uh, you've mentioned. And I'm, I'm personally even also invested in that and really, really interested to see that. So yeah, investments ready, being SD, SDG strategy focus, solving real business problems because some people actually come up with businesses that does make sense and business scalability and sustainability. Um, that has happened and I know a lot of people are struggling with that um, right now. So um, thank you very much for all the, to all the panelists, uh, I mean, to all the speakers who, who have given us some insights. Uh, we're going to move to our first panelist. We have two panelists before we wrap up this entire session. Um, so we're going to go to the first panel, um, which will be moderated by Anlawi, uh, talking about unlocking investments for African founder startups. Where are we? What are we doing? What are we doing right? What can we improve? Um, so I'm going to give it back to Anlawi to just uh, take that panel. Just a very short 10 minutes uh, so that we can get to the second panel and wrap up this entire webinar. Um, so keep on tweeting, keep on asking questions in the chat room, keep on sharing information, ask questions that you need to ask, uh, because you don't get these chances every single time to be able to have access to all of these people who can give you a lot of insights. So, I'm Larry. Thank you, Bright. Thank you. And once again, thank you, everyone, for creating time to be with us today. Um, I'll be starting our conversation on, um, on uh, unlocking investment for African funded startups. And uh, with me, I have an amazing um, panel of panelists um, that will be joining me. And I would want to welcome them. I start with Esther Deity. Esther, you here? Can you hear me? You're on mute, Esther. How are you? No, sorry. This is the standard thing. You forget to unmute yourself, but how are you? <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm happy to have you here and to host you. Esther, can you, can you start with a quick, a small introduction of yourself? All right. Uh, so as you know, my name is Esther Detti. I am the investment lead at Ancap Capital. Um, I have had a background in about, well, about over a decade uh, working in the investment entrepreneurship space. Um, I like to call myself the early stage funding evangelist because I'm extremely passionate about small and growing businesses and ensuring that we have capital flowing towards them um, to ensure that they make it past that five-year mark that some of the panelists have mentioned so far. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Esther. Thank you so much. We are glad to have you here. Um, my next panelist is Gahu Chege. Are you there? Hi, yes, I am. So you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you and welcome. Can you, you can go ahead and introduce yourself briefly? All right, my name is um, Gathi Chege. I work with um, Akimena Global um, Impact Investor. Um, and, and our work is spread out across um, four continents. Um, and really excited to be here. Um, to meet uh, uh, to meet such an exciting um, group of panelists and 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 speakers and and you know get these insights um, and I look forward to um, interacting with um, a lot of the entrepreneurs here. Thank you. Thank you, Gazo. And finally, my uh, my final panelist is Paul, a person that I have known for across ten years now. I came across when he was starting out and he was uh, looking for initial uh, seed capital to start his, um, the, the first businesses that he uh, uh, pivoted to what he's building now. So Paul, can you, um, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Anne. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, how are you? Hi, is everybody? My name is Paul Kimani. I'm the CEO and co-founder at WorkPay. 
Uh, what we are a people management platform. Uh, we are building solutions to help companies, especially the ones that are fast growing in Africa and emerging markets to manage their people better, uh, both those who are working locally in their uh, workstations and also those who are working remotely. So really excited to be here and also proud to say that I'm also a Pangea investee, uh, probably among the first people that they invested in. Super excited. Thank you, Paul. Um, and also very happy to host all of you here. I want to start this conversation as you have had with all our speakers. It's all about the opportunities and investment um, that we can be able to avail for the businesses across the continent. Uh, but it has been a long forthcoming conversation uh, for those who have been in the ecosystem, uh, like Esther and, and Gatu. And I wanted to just hear um, uh, from your perspective, uh, from where we are coming from, uh, where, uh, and, and for Esther, if we can start with you, uh, where are we in terms of driving investment accessibility for African founded businesses? Esther. So that's a big question, really, and I'll try to unpack it, um, but also keep it really short because of uh, time constraints. Um, I think in terms of investment accessibility, and I'll really focus on startups here, um, as opposed to sort of like the bigger SME space. Um, you know, there has been challenges over the past decade or so. If you think about it, venture funding in East Africa or in Kenya um, is pretty nascent. Um, you know, the first venture capital investments were being done, what, about 15 years ago or so. So essentially, there's, it's still a teenager in, uh, if you're looking at the, sort of like the life cycle of, um, of venture funding. However, things have changed and, I, I, and for the better, in my opinion. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight um, quickly before um, sort of like the more obvious things is sort of like the role of data uh, right now. Um, so essentially how venture funding was happening um, in the past, um, or rather still happening, but you know, uh, less so now was that um, information around where the funding sits would sit within specific relationships and networks, right? Um, that has since changed, um, it's getting better, uh, where we have more data out there and more publications and more networks who are sort of like availing data out there in terms of who's doing the funding, um, where, what kind of businesses are being funded, what ticket sizes are there. And this is really important because as you're raising, as you're building your business, you know, now you're able to just go online, um, you know, to Digest Africa, Disrupt Africa, Bright Bridges, Asoko, whatever, TechCrunch, all these things and be able to see where capital flow is happening. Um, second thing I want to mention is sort of like uh, currently uh, venture funding is underpinned by foreign capital. So because of that has come with specific constraints, right? So accessing capital that is being sourced in another continent, you know, you know, are you able to sort of like go and make pitches out to investors who you're not even familiar with? Uh, and, and those that come into the continent, you know, not having deep enough relationships and or wide enough connections to be able to get that information out there. So one of the things that we're seeing in terms of accessibility is that, um, you know, there's more local capital going into venture funding, which is really exciting. Um, I know uh, my, my, the, form, the speaker earlier from uh, KNCCI, I think, uh, talked about, actually it was Terry Adembesta who talked about um, 12 trillion uh, AUM sitting under, um, you know, uh, what are they called, retirement benefits authority, uh, the various pension schemes, and how we're trying to move that into more startup funding. That is still going to, that's a, still, <laughs> that's a big ball to roll up a hill. Uh, but what we're seeing is, um, you know, local uh, players, um, local uh, people, moving away from traditional assets, uh, real estate, and trying to you know, uh, diversify where they're investing their money, including into startups. Um, then of course, there's diaspora remittances which you're working on, which is fantastic. Uh, just a percentage of that 340 million that you talked about, $340 million is fantastic. Um, and also just the wider Africa. So if you look at Africa, uh, sort of like how that will end up playing out, uh, you know, so not only there'll be movement of capital, movement of talent and movement of goods, what I'm looking forward to see, seeing is movement of capital. So, so I've talked about data, I've talked about sort of like the nature of the venture funding and where it sits. Um, another thing we're seeing is new instruments moving away from straight debt uh, and straight equity to various models and instruments such as um, revenue-based financing, which what we do at ANCAP, um, where we take the, we make the entrepreneur sort of like in charge of the funding and you know, their cash flows are used to make the payment back to the investor. Um, so these new instruments are really good because what was happening was that if an entrepreneur was not 
you know, um, high growth or very interesting to a venture capital firm, but too risky for a bank, it was really hard for them to access capital. Um, so seeing these new interest instruments being developed, these hybrid models out there um, is really interesting. And then just lastly, um, is intentional capital. I think there have been errors over the past two decades in terms of where capital was flowing to. And so now we're seeing a lot of intentional capital going to either early stage businesses, um, you know, the, the time when the ticket sizes were so big and it didn't really make sense um, in terms of the bulk of the businesses and what they really needed. So we're seeing a lot more um, de dedicated funds to early stage funding. We're seeing funds who are creating gender lens vehicles to ensure that there are more women-led businesses who are accessing capital. And we're also seeing um, local founders uh, being who are previously overlooked, um, being targeted um, as, as the recipients of this capital. So they're in the investment accessibility, occupation is, is being improved on day by day as we move along. Thank you, Esther. Thank you so much. And I think what sits well with what you've just said is um, ensuring that investment and capital is available in the continent uh, to be able to be flexible and accessible to most of the businesses that you're supporting. Paul, I come to you uh, and, and because you have been through this process of fundraising. Um, you just crossed an investment round last year. What are the three top insights and learning from your experience? Yeah, thanks, and um, I think I'd start by saying that um, fundraising is tough and takes time, requires a lot of patience, um, and you have to have some basic things that you need to have you as an entrepreneur, as a founder, in place for you to be able to be successful in fundraising. So uh, I think top of it, uh, in my opinion, is that you need to be able to uh, be solving a real problem. Um, I think that one is said more than enough times. And this ensure that the business is going to be sustainable, that you're actually actually solving a problem big enough for people to be able to pay for it or a big enough inconvenience that we're moving from people uh, to be able to uh, uh, to pay for it. So I think that is key to me that you, are, you need to do that. And then the other thing is that you need to be able to uh, to be looking at the market of where, uh, which kind of problem you are solving. I think there was an earlier a speaker who say that, are you looking at um, like your town, your village? Are you able to see how you can expand this globally? Are you able to see how you can move this uh, not only in Kenya, uh, in Africa, uh, in a bigger space? And are you able to actually communicate uh, that to the investors? And are they able to actually see uh, the market that you are uh, trying to target? Uh, like for us, for example, um, as I said, that we, we build solutions around HR payroll. Uh, payments and also what you have done is that you have embedded finance on top, on top of that. Uh, it was very clear from day one and the way the message that we have were communicating to our investors, which we still communicate to, to today, and we are on that mission is that we want to build a solution uh, starting from Africa and then move to uh, the emerging markets um, uh, when you're doing that. So the market has to be really, really clear um, uh, to the investor. And of course, you need to communicate it in numbers. You need to see how big can this project that you're starting uh, can go. And then the other one uh, is that you need to understand uh, as you are solving this problem, as you're targeting this very big market, you need to have some basics about the numbers. So you need like really to understand how are you going to uh, to make your money? How are you going to uh, to balance your cash flow? Like you need to really, as much as uh, times probably you are a, probably a technical person, you're an engineer, uh, you are, a, or even someone who is coming from sales or someone is coming from business, you really need to be uh, understand uh, how your numbers look like. You need to be able to communicate that numbers uh, to your investors. So uh, it's not only understanding, but it's also uh, being able to communicate. And, and that is very, very key uh, to me uh, uh, on top of my mind that you need to, number one, be solving a real problem um, and be able to communicate it to your investors. You need to see us, um, show how big uh, that market is uh, in the problem that you are trying to solve. And then you have to, need to be able to understand um, uh, the numbers that, that you have. And of course, uh, it is important that you probably have traction that you're able to show uh, this, how far we have come. And probably once you get this investment, this how far we wanna go, yeah. Thank you so much, Paul. Sorry, thank you. Thank you so much, I was on mute. Um, thank you, I have taken that um, in, and for all the entrepreneurs and I know we have so many as part of this conversation today. I think my take out is that you have to, to, to build 
a solution or rather build a product that is solving real problem in the real world. Um, Gatu, I come to you and I saw somewhere, um, I think on one of FAQ for Acumen um, and uh, it mentioned that as Acumen, you do not accept unsolicited proposals, you only build pipeline for referrals. Now, what does that mean? Uh, and I would also want to hear what measures as acumen are you putting in place to make investment more available to African founded businesses? And I know you're huge in impact, uh, but how is it, how are you making it, uh, making the investment more available? Um, thank you, Anna. Um, those two very good questions. I will um, begin with the first one. Um, I, I, I recognize that, and, and this is something that internally at Acumen we recognize the challenge for us in pipeline building. And therefore, what we have done um, is that for, for us here in East Africa, we've been able to roll out um, a Google form um, that's available on our website where entrepreneurs can come and fill in their information, attach their pitch decks to give us access to more um, information. So um, with regard to like uh, referrals and whatnot, I think we put that as a stopgap measure, as a measure to, um, to be able to engage um, local and, 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 and all entrepreneurs more. To your second question, in terms of the measures that um, we, we, we are putting, so I'll, 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 I'll really speak about um, what we are, we are doing now. I know that um, this challenge of investment in African founded businesses is really, really um, huge. And you've seen it because of the data points that we've looked at in, um, in Africa. We've seen it more pronounced in East Africa as compared to West Africa and South Africa. And therefore, one of the things that we are doing is that we have um, decided to um, refresh our strategy and deliberately focus it on um, what we are calling locally founded um, businesses, especially here in East Africa. And one of the things that we've done is that we've engaged an external consultant to you know, interview and collect data from different ecosystem players, especially African-founded businesses and use these insights to, um, you know, look at, to, to, to incorporate these insights into this new strategy. So just to mention, this new strategy um, focuses on having 75% of our future investment be locally founded um, slash African founded businesses. And we believe that this intentional focus will, you know, will, he will help Acumen as an impact investor, um, you know, um, provide more, so uh, provide solutions to the overarching challenges that we are facing in the ecosystem. Um, and having said that, I think I'll outline three measures that um, we are using currently. So the first measure is we are, as, as Esther pointed out, we are focusing on, um, you know, reducing our ticket sizes um, as we go earlier stage, obviously, and focus on business that have the potential to have catalytic change. Two, we are considering using um, flexible financial instruments. We are discussing safes. We are discussing revenue share agreements. Um, and, 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 and the intention of this really is to make sure and help these businesses, um, you know, grow. And, and our focus is um, to ensure that all these um, startups and businesses which have improved business models really have a chance in East Africa. Then lastly, we are, um, you know, we've, 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 um, we, 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 we decided to intentionally go earlier stage to exploit these pioneer gap opportunities in keeping to arguments, um, you know, prior experience here in East Africa. And we believe that going more earlier stage give us, gives us an opportunity to have, you know, to, 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 uh, to build on the impact that we've, uh, that we've had in East Africa. And um, yeah, so that, that, that really is our strategy. And um, we will we'll be very, very happy to, um, of course, like get more and more, um, you know, uh, pipeline opportunities here in East Africa by guys like um, just um, going directly and, and um, pitching their proposals to our website. Thank you. Anne. Thank you, Gatu. If someone wants to be invested or to be considered for investment, what do they do for Acumen? Uh, where do they get? Do they go to your website to get information on how they can be? You have cycles for funding. If you can say that in 30 seconds. 
All right. Um, so there's, you know, there's, of course, we still um, obviously get referrals and we are still using that portal in our website to be able to um, get this pipeline. So our funding cycle is pretty straightforward. Um, I have to mention that our sectors of focus are three, that is agriculture, energy, and education. And, um, you know, investment takes um, any, anything between three to six months, depending on the information from the company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And because of time, I would want to ask my speakers to wrap up. So uh, Esther, in your wrapping quickly as you wrap up, um, what are the next frontiers for investment um, in your wrapping up? Uh, in 30 seconds, you can tell us. What is the more clear in terms of frontiers? Are you talking about geographic frontiers or are you talking about what are we going to see in capital changes in terms of structure? Exactly. Uh, what, what, what are the new frontiers in terms of making investment available for uh, African founded businesses? Okay, so I'll just speak about AdCup. Uh, I think one of the things that we're, we're doing that's a, a new frontier is that we've automated um, the entire investment application process, right? Um, where you're not going to have to meet investors face to face, you log into our platform, um, you put on your details. Um, and you apply for funding and you've built in algorithms and, and, and various tests to be able to assess entrepreneurial potential for early stage founders. Um, what I would say in terms of, what I would say is what we're going to say in the future is more capital going to early stage business and startups across Africa. Um, you see up until 2019, we were able to see a really high, um, I think it was the highest African startups were able to raise in terms of capital up to that point. Um, it dipped in 2020 by 30%. But then this year, we're looking at that going even higher than, 29, uh, than, than in 2019. So funding for African startups will reach a record high um, this year. So that is something to look at. And it's, it's moving into various countries, not just the various, the, the big four, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, South Africa. Uh, but we're seeing other countries starting to pop up and be able to attract this capital, which is really fantastic. Uh, and again, I already mentioned in terms of local capital participating, which is really exciting. Um, and also being able to understand that African businesses showed resilience after COVID. And so there's a lot more attraction in terms of um, investors um, wanting to see what is this might produce that we're seeing within African entrepreneurs. So we'll see more capital coming into the continent. We'll see a lot more local capital unlocked and we'll see various models and structures are uh, being utilized that have we've not seen in the past. Uh, and therefore, I guess that's a new frontier for us. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Esther. Uh, Paul, uh, as you wrap up, what are the, um, as, a, as an entrepreneur, how can I position myself to get investment? Uh, what are the tips you can share? In 30 seconds, please. So I, I think the most important thing is that um, uh, when you want to position yourself uh, to get investment is that you need to really uh, understand uh, what you're, you're trying to build and also who you are building it for and how big that can be. And then the other thing is, of course, you need to be, um, uh, be able to find networks on how you're able to get these investors. So uh, one of the key things uh, that probably happened and probably this is why probably most of the funds were going to uh, uh, what we may call expert uh, founders is that money follows um, is more of a network issue. So if you don't know where these people are, if you don't have networks that you can uh, really be able to leverage, can become a bit hard for you to be able to raise. So you need to position yourself, get to where these people are. Uh, this could be uh, in programs like what Panjaya is doing, and also uh, in other uh, programs that are available there for, be, for you to be able to be uh, uh, get this funding. But the most important thing is that you are really building a solid business. You really understand uh, what you're doing. Uh, I think uh, eventually funds will be, you'll be able to, uh, to find uh, funds and uh, you'll be able to get people who will be interested in uh, uh, backing your business. so much thank you so much Paul and lastly uh, Kathu as an entrepreneur and I want to unlock investment from acumen what are the key things that I need to be aware of? Um, I think this is a very broad, um, broad topic but I will say that um, from the entrepreneurs I've seen you know you know just be you know come prepared um prepare you know be very apt in your presentation um know what you want i think that's very very important if you're raising money what is 
what is your cash going you know towards and obviously um understand your business that for me is very key understand your business model understand the problem that you're trying to solve and understand the challenge that you're trying to solve and be very um, um you know be very coherent about it such that as an investor i am able to understand that problem without having to go back and um, read um, the pitch deck yeah i would say that um, on a high level that's um, what would be required of me thanks Thank you so much, Gathu. Um, I come to the end of this panel discussion. I hope you have been able to pick uh, some insights and some um, uh, some leads in terms of how you composition your business. And I would want to hand it back to um, Bright. Over to you. Um, thank you very much. Um, that was very insightful and. Uh, Again, I keep learning so much um, from everybody, whoever speaks here. Um, so I think we're just going to get to the last part of the panelists. Um, so I'm going to invite my panelists, uh, Dr. Tuf Tusif and also Awil Osman. If you could just turn in your cameras. Dr. Tusif. OK, I think we'll just. We'll just uh, just uh, work with a bit of time. So, so uh, I, will, I, will, I will listen to the expert, expert and a certain entrepreneur with vast experience in design and developing acceleration incubation programs, which comes every day of startups in East Africa. So, maybe just my first question to you uh, new markets are created under the Africa continent free trade area. Uh, agreement is estimated to be as large as 1.3 billion people across Africa. With the combined GDP of 3.4.3, will, will this, this shape up the present uh, trade in any way? And, and why do you think so? Um, thank you very much, Daktari. Uh, yes, um, I think one of when you talk to the entrepreneurs um, across Africa and in even Europe and everywhere else, uh, one of the biggest challenges they all share is actually access to finances. So, um, and also uh, access to, uh, the second one would be like access to markets. So um, if uh, businesses and startups and entrepreneurs across Africa uh, get to those two main essential um, um, uh, like things, I think they will be able to actually uh, make an impact and, and create a lot of jobs. The first one is like, you know, like uh, access to financing. Uh, we're talking about uh, not uh, the financing of like ten thousand and twenty thousand dollars, but we're talking about like you know, like huge investments. But of course, for startups and small tickets, um, and also like access to markets, there is uh, a lot of small businesses and enterprises that are actually doing very well um, in Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, across Africa. Uh, but sometimes they even have problems um, accessing uh, markets within their country. Uh, because of licensing issues and regulations. So I believe if um, uh, the free market uh, will actually create and uh, uh, put um, the African entrepreneurs and Af African uh, businesses to actually benefit from that, and they will be able to actually move forward and, and do businesses in South Africa, they'll be able to set up shops in, and sometimes even virtually, they don't have to actually be physically in Egypt to actually do business, but they'll, because of the, the regulations and like, you know, like the, 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 the setup that has been made uh, legally, they'll be able to actually do business in Egypt, Tanzania, um, Uganda, Somalia, whatever that is actually possible for them. And of course, um, uh, you need, when you're ex actually expanding uh, across borders, you need financing. So if the financing is provided and the quite the regulatory um, space is actually provided, I believe uh, uh, that will create like you know, a ripple effect across Africa. Oh, thank you very much for, for that. Um, Dr. Tusif, welcome. Um, we thought we lost you for a bit. <laughs> um, so just a uh, brief about uh, Dr. Tusif is an entrepreneur and maverick business evangelist and artist are the words that inspired to contribute to his journey under the watchful eyes of the almighty, which humbles him in the life of his work. I, I wanted to ask you the first question. Um, we're just gonna keep it um, very short. Uh, Islamic finance is a $3.5 trillion market with uh, only 23% of it in Africa and 1% getting channeled back into Africa, whereas 3% of the population in Africa is Islamic. How can we increase the 1% focus 
in Africa to support this Islamic uh, startup building. Uh, you're on mute, please. Can you just unmute? Uh, and, and kindly keep it very brief because of time. Uh, so if you can just keep sure. it very brief. Thank you. Yeah. See, Islamic finance is growing the problem with Islamic finance or halal investment is uh, most of the countries are not Muslim countries. So there's a problem establishing Islamic bank or a financial institution. Uh, luckily in Africa, whether it's a secular country or a non you know, a religious country, you know, by state law, uh, there is options of Islamic finance and it has been not done, but a few organizations have been very active doing that. And uh, we want, to, uh, as Halal Angels Network, we want to use this opportunity and uh, connect all these uh, angel investors across the globe to tap to African market. Now, when you say Islamic finance, uh, actually, uh, it, it sounds very religious, but when you look at halal financing, halal financing means ethical financing. And that's what Africa needs. It doesn't need to, uh, crony uh, hot money which comes in and goes out. Like, you know, when charity came, it just devastated Africa. So we don't want the hot money to come and just go. So ethical finance is for long term and halal finance is actually ethical finance. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll, I'll go back to Will. Um, so, so what opportunities lie in the Islamic finance sector and how can we tap into these untapped opportunities? And also if you could just touch a little bit on the governance and regulations uh, on Islamic finance and startup investments. Um, um, thank you very much again uh, good question um uh, as as the doctor said uh, dr Tos tosif malik said earlier uh there's a uh, a lot of misunderstanding when it comes when it comes to like islamic financing so it's like you know the moment you hear like you know like a maybe a certain bank in in in, in your country is actually offering like Islam, islamic financing product uh you will think it's actually meant for the islamic people with islamic faith uh, but it's not. It's uh, uh, like you know, like any other product or any other service that's actually been offered. It's only that you know, like it comes like under the Islamic Sharia law, uh, which usually doesn't allow um, interest and also like avoid high risk um, uh, businesses um, such as such as gambling and like you know, like uh, maybe uh, things like you know, like uh, uh, that that are, that are that are not uh, that are prohibited in in, in Islam. Um, uh, I've worked um, in uh, Somalia and uh, all the banks are Sharia compliant. Um, in this aspect, they are able to actually provide uh, products, uh, Islamic uh, um, products that are actually suited for the SMEs, startups, and also like for corporates. Um, uh, most of them are, are like are, are very favorable and, and they look very suitable for, for, for business to actually take. Uh, though still, um, the uptake is actually very low because of the requirements actually because banks have like you know like very high level requirements for the for for startups and SMEs to actually uh, get investments but I believe um, if this is actually open up to um, uh, almost everyone and you know like it's demystified and you know like the right uh, communication and the right um, uh, like you know like message actually put across uh, it will be um, a very uh, it will be like a very interesting and and like uh, favorable um uh, investment for for like you know like for the growing um tech industry in 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 uh, and, and business uh, environment in in africa you, you have brought us something which um uh, is, something is something that we never, we never get to understand it's thinking islamic, islamic finance it means you have, you have to be islamic to have to get access to that money um so i really really appreciate for you to diversify that for us um i'll back to you uh doctor uh, how would you define Islamic finance and it can diaspora become a strong player or contributed for entrepreneurs in the sector to drive economic impact on the continent? See, as uh, Avil said, and I said earlier, Islamic finance is the core uh, concept is uh, interest-free business. When you take interest, you're stuck. And when you look at, uh, when you look at stock markets and when you look at Apple, when you look at debt to equity ratio, the debt, when there's zero debt, the stock values goes high. And in Islam, there's something called risk factor. 
So Islamic factor, uh, when you whether it's banking or individual, they take is like a, you know a risk factor. Uh, so it people whether it's a financial institution or individual investors, they come as equal partners. So whatever kind of financial instrument you look from Islamic uh, you know finance. But you have to do away with uh, interest, which is called riba. And when you look at Bible or the Torah or all the religious book, they have always forbidden interest. Okay. And when you look at stock, uh, when you look at central banks, when there's zero, uh, when interest rates are dropped, the economy bumps up. So interest-free economy is always good. When you look at halal, halal means it has to be sustainable. It has to be good for the environment. It has to be good for all the stakeholders, whether you're a startup. Your startup has to be good for the environment. It has to pay people on time. It has to honor your commitment towards the government in, in terms of taxes. You have to honor your investment. You have to honor your team people. So that's where when you, look, when you are equal to every stakeholder, then it becomes halal and ethical finance. So there's a huge market and, you know, the diaspora, because I lived in London, I lived in uh, Middle East and, you know, in America, uh, there's a lot of African diaspora, uh, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, they want to come back. And uh, majority, if you say 30 to 40 percent of the African population is Muslim, that can be tapped. And there's a lot of people who believe in ethical finance. So those people, when, uh, as uh, I will say, if you do a proper education, people will not say it's religious, it will become ethical. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, that, that is, those are details that we have been missing out a lot. And again, I, I really thank you for making time. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Awe, uh, Dr. Tusif and Awil Osman for gracing this event and being able to break down some of these complex questions that we have. Uh, we have been wondering about and we try to get some answers too. So with that, um, that comes to the end of my panel. Um, and I think we're just going to go into uh, the Q&A session before the program launch and unveiling. Um, I'll call back, I'll call back Anlawi to be able to answer some of these questions, which we have been seeing in the comment section. Some of them are coming to the panelist uh, uh, zone. Um, so I'll just ask two questions and which you can help us to um, to answer. The first one is, do you have an Ethiopian, do you have to be an Ethiopian national or resident or just a business in Ethiopia to be eligible for the application? Thank you, Dr. Bright. That's a good question. Um, our focus and uh, the businesses that we're looking for in these three countries for the pilot, uh, the, um, the basic requirement is that you must be a registered business in that country and you must have a local founder as part of the co-founders for that business. Uh, so if you have a registered business in eight of the three countries and you have a local founder, a founder uh, from that business, it doesn't have to be from that country. They are African founded founders uh, from that company uh, business registered in that, uh, either of the countries, then you'll, be qualified, you'll qualify. Uh, for the program. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean that you qualify for investment because the investment consideration will have to go the other investment criteria uh, that I had highlighted before. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and one last question um, before I hand over to you for the launch. Uh, are there any specific areas that, that you're focusing on for this program um, that, that the listeners and viewers need to know about? Thank you. And uh, in terms of the sectors, we are not sector specific as per se, but we have some sectors that we uh, we have affinity for uh, as of now. Uh, we, we are looking for business that um, agree in agriculture or agri uh, value chains in different value chains in agriculture, uh, business in education, uh, if you have a business or product in uh, education, uh, food security, health sector, data focus solutions, um, um, a solution in environment and uh, environment focused businesses, um, climate change and sustainable use of natural resources and also other areas that are addressing SDGs. So we are sector agnostic, uh, but also with keen affinity to some of those areas and any business and or solution that is addressing SDGs. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much for that. Um, kindly please check the, the, the chat area, which a lot of information has been shared. I saw Gatu Chega, who spoke earlier on, shared details of where you can submit your application on the Acumen Africa, East Africa page. Um, also, Esther shared details about unconventional.capital. Um, so keep the questions coming and they can answer to you directly of, of information that you want to. Now we've come to the last part, last part of this program, which is the program launch and unveiling. Um, so I'm going to hand it over back to Anne to be able to, to actually launch this program officially, and then we can close it from there. Back to you, Anne. Thank you so much, uh, Bright, again. Um, I think we have already done so much of unveiling. We have been able to share most details in terms of how you can be able to, uh, what are the criteria and what are the things that you need to be aware of to apply to this program. We have also shared the highlights and um, uh, the brief overview of uh, our, fundraise, our fundraising and um, the channels of investments that we are looking at. But the key things for those who are looking forward to apply or came so that they can be able to get some insights on how to apply, kindly go to our website, pangeatrust.co um, uh, and then slash uh, call for investment. Uh, you will see a button where you can be able to submit your application. And in terms of timelines, in terms of timelines like I had shared before, we have right our call for application open. Uh, we'll be closing on 24th of September. We will start selection um, immediately after the closure. And by 10th of October, we'll be able to announce the 10 finalists. Um, and we kick off the due diligence of the selected startup plus investor readiness based on the needs of those businesses. We'll also carry out the KYC to get to know the businesses so that we can be able to make investment decision. We anticipate to have uh, initial investment decision come December. So we would want to invite all the entrepreneurs, anyone with a business, uh, just to make sure that you have a strong, competent team, address a need in the market, make sure that your business have potential markets, uh, and also it has its post revenue for you to stand a good chance to, um, to be among the finalists to be selected. Thank you so much for everyone who came in today. If you have any further questions, I think I have seen my colleagues sharing emails that you can be able to send in your questions. We also have the Pangea info email available on our website. You can be able to log in and share all your questions. Um, we will be on standby to answer all your questions. Thank you so much to our partner Sida for making this successful and we look forward to more cycles of investment to more businesses. Um, African founded businesses across Africa. So thank you. Back to you, Bright. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, and with that, I think we've come to the end of our program. Um, and I just want to say thank you for every single person who have joined, where you are, wherever you are that you're joining in from. Um, but a special, special thanks to, first of all, to Pangea Trust for hosting this session. Uh, thanks to Felix Osok, uh, Terence Debsa, Julius Opio, Paul Kimani, Gatti Chege, Esther Detti, Will Osman, and Dr. Tusiv uh, for gracing this event and giving us so much information that we never got access to um, earlier before. And I know everybody's asking where this information is going to be, where are we going to put them? It's going to be, it's actually streaming on, on YouTube right now. Go to the Pangea Trust YouTube uh, page and you're going to find all of this information that is there. Also, don't go, don't forget to go to the website, uh, spangetrust.co, uh, and you get to apply, get to get all the information that is there. Um, and, and also on, on, the, on the other pages, Instagram, um, check on Twitter, check on, on LinkedIn, ask questions, get to DM them, get to send them messages and get all the information as you need. In terms of presentation and all of these details, um, you'll get all of them from there. So with that, I'll say thank you. My name is Bright Kameli Mahudo, uh, and I've been your host. And um, well, thank you for, for making this event happen and have a lovely evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You can turn on your camera to say bye. <laughs>
Uh, Wydera, who has been in the background, getting all the slides to work. Uh, Karen. And, uh, and the Pangea team, could, could, could you share the Pangea team who is behind the scenes? It's a whole room of full of people who have been working in the background, making sure this happened. Christine. John Nasibin. John Nasibin. John is there. So yeah, there's a whole lot of team members who have been trying to get this working. It's, it's not even easy. And um, they will be behind the scenes again to ask questions when you need to. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Don't hesitate to send your DMs. Don't hesitate to, if you don't ask questions, you'll never ever get to know. So please get to ask questions, get access to this funding, get access to information and easy way of being able to scale your business. Most people are still struggling to understand where do I even start? Where do I get to? Investment ready, SDG strategic focus. How this creating real solving uh, businesses, uh, business scalability and sustainability. If you can't sustain your business, you can't scale. So there's a whole lot of other details there. Check the hashtag, check the Twitter pages, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, website, and get access to all of this. So thank you very much for everybody who has joined in and uh, we look forward to more details of um, sessions that are gonna happen. Uh, Pangea Trust will be sending out information and also check my Instagram page. I'll get to be sharing more information every now and then. Um, so have a lovely evening and morning and, and afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> Bye.